Hey, thanks for tuning in to our online service. We hope that today is going to be an inspiration to you, an encouragement, possibly a conviction of something that God's asking you to do or stop doing. We've been in this Nehemiah series that's been really good for that and the idea of building up the, the spiritual walls in our life. And so let's jump into some prayer and then we'll get started. Father God, just thank you, Lord, so much for the opportunity to rest in you, to gather in you, to be with you. Lord, we just ask for you to speak to us today, Lord, that we could hear your voice and know what you would ask us to do, Lord. Lord, help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I said, we've been in this Nehemiah series for quite a while. We're starting in Nehemiah chapter 8 today. So the first six chapters of Nehemiah were the, the restoration of the walls. Last week was that pivoting chapter where transitions from the restoration of the wall. And now we're going to see a restoration of God's people. And so we're going to see a renewing of things. In my study this week, um, one, of, one of the things I read from a gentleman by the name of Derek Kidner, and it states that this day was to prove a turning point. From now on, the Jews would predominantly be a people of the book. And what it's talking about is the idea of, of being a people who lived by the book, the Bible. And John Wesley, if you know anything about John Wesley, John Wesley was known for making the comment that he's a man of one book. The idea that he, he is a man of the Bible. He, he lived his life. His choices were made. His wisdom came from the Bible, as it should be for us. When I was reading this, and we start a restoration of people and, and how God's people start to make a change, we're going to read that here today in a lot of these scriptures. But God's people have gone through cycles where where his word has been neglected in their life. And then that leads to really a condition of his people deteriorating over time, which usually leads to a, a punishment, a, a discipline, a, a, cap, a captivity that they have to go through. And it's only by his grace where God sends renewal. And this is one of those times. Inevitably, one of the main marks of a renewal in a person's life or in, a, in the people is when there's a renewal of an emphasis on God's word. We see in the Old Testament when Judah suffers under the godless reign of, of King Manasseh. Uh, we'll, we'll read, you can read about that in 2 Chronicles 34. But you see where they suffer under King Manasseh and then his son Ammon. And Ammon's son is actually Josiah. And so King Josiah, at age 16, starts to institute a spiritual reform. As a matter of fact, the priest underneath him, a gentleman by the name of Hel Helkiah, the priest found a copy of God's law. And in 2 Chronicles 34, 14, it says that, Josiah, that he found that copy and Josiah called the nation to repentance. Revival happens because God's word is obeyed. If we want a revival in our life personally, if we want a revival in our country, if we want a revival in this world, God's word has to be obeyed. It can't be any other way. The same thing happened during the Reformation, which at the heart of the revival was about God's word. The Roman Catholic Church had neglected God's word. As a matter of fact, most of the priests were the only ones that had access to it, and most of them didn't really know or understand the contents of what was there. A gentleman by the name of John Wycliffe and William Tydell, they labored to get the Bible translated into common English. At the time, Martin Luther translated it into German, and John Calvin was known to be preaching expository sermons. So the, Rep the Reformation theme was based on a phrase that was called sola scriptura, which means by scripture alone. And it renewed God's people because of that. Nehemiah 8 is going to show us four things that have to happen for us to have spiritual renewal in our lives personally, in our families, in our community, but above all things throughout this world. So as God's people, if we want this spiritual renewal, if we want this revival in our life, then this is what has to happen. For spiritual renewal, God's people must read his word. In verse 1, this is what was institutional, what was institutionalized at that time. It says, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded 
for Israel. You know, the, that phrase that says, which the Lord had given to Moses, literally means commanded for, Loza, for Moses. The people recognized and respected the fact that God had given this material to Moses. In turn, it made it an authoritative word to them through Moses from the Lord. So copies of the law of Moses were probably somewhat rare in this time because many of the Jews had never heard or even read it or had it read to them before this until the invention of the printing press in the 15th century, the Bible had to be copied by hand. And so because of that, often there were, would only be like one copy in a city. And actually when you'd find it, oftentimes it was chained to a pulpit. So the common people, uh, everyday people, farmers and ranchers, herders, shepherds, um, the gatherers, the, the people in the courts, most of them were oftentimes illiterate because the schooling and that extra that cost money, those were things outside their reach. So the Bible would have to be read publicly so they knew what it said. You know, God could have communicated with us in a lot of different forms, but he chose to give his word in writing. We live in a culture where almost all of us know how to read. And if there are any of us that can't or, or aren't any good at it, there are a lot of options for us. As a matter of fact, if you're a visual learner, you can get the Bible in a video base. If you're an auditory learner, you can listen to it because we have tons of options to hear and have the Bible read to us. It comes in many different translations. It comes in many different versions. It comes in many different languages and people still choose not to learn it. For the good of your soul, I would challenge you to read it all the way through from Genesis to Revelation. Pick just to read the Old Testament this year. Pick just to read the New Testament this year. Pick to choose to read just the Gospels. Pick a book of the Bible. But in the end, read the Bible through and through. Because if you want revival and renewal in your life and your soul, it takes God's Word. Matter of fact, it's so important in Psalms 119, the author says nine times how God's Word brings revival to us. For spiritual renewal, God's people must read His Word. But for spiritual renewal, we also need God's people to be reverently listening to his word explain. Now, having ears that work don't guarantee that we really hear and listen to what God is asking us to do. We, we sometimes close off our minds, even though we may hear things in the background, we may hear things going on. We don't listen to exactly what was said when we close off our minds. This week, my, my wife has been gone, and so I've been taking care of four of our children at the house. And that first week, it's mom, 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 mom. That first day it was mom, 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 mom. Well, then I'm like, your mom's not here. Your mom's not here. Well, then that turns to dad. Dad, 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 I need this. Dad, I'm hungry. Dad, I want this. Dad, what about this? Dad, what about that? You know, it, it gets to a place where, where in looking in that, like, you, you start to tune them out. And I, I know that sounds bad, but you do. You start to tune them out. And they've had to realize that when I'm typing something, I'm emailing or working on something, I, I need them to wait for me to finish that thought or I'm going to lose it. I need them to not ask a question when I'm sending someone a text because I'll lose that thought in that time. And so they've, they've had to learn that as dad, 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 dad. And I found myself slightly tuning them out. In the same way, it is very possible for us to hear the Bible read, but our mind be somewhere else. That's why when Jesus said often, he who has ears, let them hear. If the Bible contains the very word that God himself is saying to us, then we need to listen attentively and reverently to what it has to say. The people in Nehemiah 8 were a great example of that. In verse three it says, then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midnight before the men and women of those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. See, we read that they were attentive. They were anticipating what he was gonna say. They were ready. They were focused 
in not just hearing, but listening to what God's word was. But we also have to have a reverence in God's word. We see that in verse 5 and 6. They show us what that means. It says, And Ezra opened the book in sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, when all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands, and then they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. See, they stood up like you would greet a royal visitor, but then they bowed down in worship to the Lord. Attentiveness stems from our reverence in the Lord. Because if we maintain our reverence in God, then we will pay attention to what he says. We will be attentive to it because of our reverence in him, our respect, our fear to the Lord and what he has. If we forget that this is the living word of our God, then our minds will wander to other things in life. Charles Spurgeon tells about a story of a gentleman who was an 18th century English preacher by the name of Roland Hill. Roland Hill was on his deathbed and he had a visitor of one of his old friends who came to him and said that he literally remembered a part of his sermon that he gave 65 years before that. And so Roland Hill wanted to know what it was he remembered. And this is what he said the preacher had said. He says, suppose you went to, to hearing the reading of the will of one of your relatives and you were expecting a big inheritance from him. You would hardly think of criticizing the manner in which the lawyer read the will. Rather, you would have all your attention turned to hear whether you, you were inheriting anything and how much that would be. That is the way to hear the gospel preached. See, spiritual renewal comes through reverently hearing God's word. Are you in a position when you go to church when you're listening to God's word, when you're reading God's word, are you reverently anticipating and attentive to what he's saying to you? Because spiritual renewal also means that the word must be taught. In verses 7 8, we read that the Levites instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. So Ezra would read a section and then his assistants, the other Levites, the other priests and stuff that were around, they would maybe in smaller groups explain what was being said to make it clear to the people. See, much of the Bible is plain to anyone who can read it. Uh, Mark Twain himself said it wasn't the sections of the Bible that he couldn't understand that bothered him. It was the parts that he could understand that troubled him. But there are some sections of scripture that are just difficult to grasp. To properly interpret it, you have to understand what the author was talking about, what it was meant in those writings to the people of their day. You also need to, to look at how the Bible fits together as a unified whole. You must grasp everything that the Bible teaches about the subject by comparing scripture to scripture. That's interpreting the Bible with itself. Sometimes that, that requires some historical research. Sometimes that requires knowing some customs, some historical events, festivals that they had at the time. Sometimes it requires knowing the original biblical language and what those particular words meant in those translations. And sometimes the meaning behind those words are even lost in our English translations today. Sometimes you have to know grammatical construction. It requires interpreting particular verses and paragraphs and scriptures in their larger context. Sometimes you have to study the chapter before, the chapter you're getting it out of, and the chapter after just to get a grasp and an understanding of what it's talking about. If you're not careful, you can take it out of context. And when we take things out of context, we can make it say whatever we want it to. We have to have sound teaching. And sound Bible teaching must be accurate, it must be clear, and it must be applicable. So it is, it is to reform our life so that it is known that we desire to serve God with our life, to give ourselves 
entirely to him, to conform ourselves to his good will. But sound Bible teaching also requires a commitment on the part of the teacher, but also the one who is being taught. Those who teach must commit themselves to time and effort to study and prepare. If you teach a class, if you teach a study, if you teach a devotional, if you teach a book study, if you teach at all, you have to be committed to being prepared to study, to know exactly what it is talking about when you move through that. If you just read the text and say whatever pops into your mind at that moment, it could be wrong. It could be out of context. It could be out of you and not necessarily what God is really trying to teach in his word. But those who who are taught also have to be committed to the word. Until now, we see that Nehemiah has been in the forefront. He has literally been a gifted administrator that has led people in the building of the wall in 52 days. But now it came a time to have a teaching of the word and people needed to receive that. We look as Nehemiah takes a back seat to Ezra, and here's a man who's skilled in the law of Moses, who had a heart to study it, to practice it, and to teach it, now become the one who's in the front run for the rest of the book. As a matter of fact, in the book of Ezra, in chapter 7, it says, Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher well-versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he asked for. The hand of the Lord was on, of his God was on him. So here we have a gifted, anointed man named Ezra to teach the law. As a matter of fact, verse 10 goes on in Ezra 7. It says, For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and the teaching, its decrees, and the law to Israel. See, these two men illustrate a beautiful principle of team ministry. Whether you are a teacher or you're being taught, you have to be committed to whatever the works that the Lord would have in your life. We have to reverently hear His Word. God's people must read His Word, but as being taught, being the one receiving, we have to attentively and reverently hear it. And the Word must be taught. Finally, if we're going to see the final spiritual renewal here, God's people must respond to his word. So not only does there need to be that reverence of listening, God's word taught, being that we were the ones being taught, we have to respond to what we hear. It's dangerous to study God's word without the goal of obedient response. If you just read it for the sake of it being a book, if you just read it for the sake of it being history, if you just read it because you want something to read, we need to attentively, reverently read it with the goal of obedience in mind. See, knowledge apart from obedience leads to pride. 1 Corinthians 8.1 teaches us, it says, We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. And what have we been working on this entire series of Nehemiah? Building the spiritual walls of our life for protection so that we can walk out what the Lord has for each and every one of us. Our aim should always be to transform our lives according to the scriptures that we read. And there are five responses that have to come for us if we are going to respond to God's word in our life. And we need all five of those to be a response. The very first one is repentance. So we see that in verse 9. It says, Now Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teachers of the law, and the Levites were instructing the people, This day is holy, and the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Well, why were the people weeping? Because they realized how much they had sinned. Spiritual renewal always requires repentance. But we also have to have a response in our life of joy. In verse 9 and 10, it says, For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
is your strength of every day wrapped up in your joy of the Lord? Is the joy of the Lord in your life above your circumstances and your situation? See, God never wounds us to hurt us. He wounds us to heal. The joy of knowing that he has forgiven all of our sins. That should fill our hearts with that joy that can only rest in him. And then it should provoke another response in our life. And that response is good deeds. Ezra and Nehemiah reminded the people to send portions of that sacrifice that they could eat to those who had nothing. As a matter of fact, he told them, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. God's word should produce compassion in our hearts for the needy. Titus 2.14 says to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. We should give with a gracious heart, with a good heart, with a giving heart. We want to give and do good deeds with joy. But then it should provoke another response. And for this to happen, that response is obedience. See, the people heard in the reading of the law that they should observe the Feast of Booths or the, the Feast of Tabernacles, as sometimes it's said. This feast commemorates both the harvest that God had just provided in delivering them with the walls being built, but also what they had been delivered from under Moses. They were supposed to build shelters and live in them for a week temporary shelters as a reminder of what it was like when they worked through all that God had worked through them in the desert. The obedience resulted in great rejoicing in their life. So not only our response of repentance, but we should also have a response of a joy in the Lord. We should have a response of our good deeds. And all of that should lead to our obedience in Him. They were so overjoyed, they were so overwhelmed, that immediately their obedience went into reserve, to, to going back to living out that festival that was required. Obedience to God. And because all of that brings a great joy into a person's heart, it also brings the last response that each of us need if we want a renewing and a revival in our life, and that's our worship to Him. See, the Feast of Booths asks for the whole week to be a celebration. In verse 18, it says, Day after day, from the day, the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. So here we have the reading of God's word. We have the, the reverence of God's word. We have an obedience to God's word. It was being read every single day. And out of it came a celebration. It says they celebrated. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in the accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. You know, in other words, there was a great rejoicing along with the reverent attention to God's Word. Do you celebrate in God every single day? Do you celebrate the sun shining? Do you celebrate the things He's provided, the roof over your head, the, the ability to have resources to survive, all those things? Is there a celebration of the Lord in your life as a direct response to the renewing of what He's brought in your life? We should be filled with a gratitude and a love towards God for his gracious dealings with us. The people here were, and they're a great example of that. You know, the reading, the studying, the preaching of God's word should produce in all of us a heart of worship. Well, how do you get that? Why, why is that so important in the renewal? It's there because of everything we read comes down to people's obedience and their attitude. We need to be a people that have a reverence for God saying, God, teach me. God, I want to know you more and more. That's all based on our attitude and our heart to what we think of the Lord. They were a people that were ready to respond to his word. Are you a people ready to respond to God's word right now in your life? They profited from his teaching. Are you profiting? from the God's word? 
Are you looking at it and making changes where you need to? Are you looking at it and being encouraged? Are you looking at it and being inspired? Are you looking at it and letting it be what guides who you are? Are you looking at it and finding that response of repentance, that response of joy, that response of good deeds, that response of, of obedience, that response of worship in your life? You know, if you want spiritual renewal, you have to check your heart. It comes when responsive hearts read and reverently hear God's word. How often right now is God's word legitimately being read in your life every single day? Do you start your day with it? Do you listen to it throughout the day? Do you end your day with God's word? How much of God's word is in your life every single day? We saw these people apply with obedience what God was asking of them. When they saw their life according to his word, the parts that did not glorify him, they wept over it. But then they changed. My prayer for everyone here today is that when you hear God's word, and it's an inspiration, that you would take that and run with it. When you get your encouragement, you'd overcome whatever is hard in your life. When you get those things that you know to be sent, that you would respond accordingly. That weeping in your soul should provoke the repentance, the joy of God's wonderful forgiveness for you, and provide a good deeds in your life as the fruit that comes out of that because you are obedient and worshiping what God really has done for you in your life. So let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for your merciful, caring, loving, graciousness gift of God and Jesus Christ, of our Lord and Savior. Lord, help us to just focus on that. Help us to rest in that. Help us to know that all of this, if we want a renewing of our soul, Lord, that that renewal comes from your word. It comes from us being reverent and listening to it, us being obedient to it, and us responding correctly and appropriately to it, Lord. Let us have that. Let us be that. Give us the encouragement to do it and help us to rest more in you, Lord, that we would know you more today than we knew you yesterday. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for tuning in to our online service. I hope that you find some inspiration, some encouragement, some conviction in God's word today, and we'll see you next week.